Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, and welcome to the 30th Annual Minnesota Book Awards. I'm Elaine Hopkins, Director of Programs in the Minnesota Book Awards for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening of celebration in honor of Minnesota's writers. Tonight is also a testament to the incredible literary community we have here and the 30 years of stories that have been published, read, and honored over the Book Awards history. Over the last 12 years, the Friends has been privileged to connect readers, writers, and communities in every corner of our state. Thank you very much for being here to attest to and celebrate the tremendous talent and passion for the literary life that we as Minnesotans have created. Everything we do is with a great network of support and partners, those who give of their time, their talent, and their financial resources. I'd like to thank all of the organizations and individuals who helped make tonight happen, um, particularly Alaris, who is the sponsor of the preface reception you were just enjoying, and I... And I would also especially like to thank our presenting sponsor, Education Minnesota, the state's educators union, representing 70,000 professionals. <laughs> 70,000 professionals working together for excellence in education for all students. Here tonight to speak to Education Minnesota's commitment to learning and literature is Secretary Treasurer Rodney Rowe. Thank you, Elena, and good evening, everyone. The educators of Minnesota are proud to sponsor the Minnesota Book Awards on this, your 30th anniversary. We do it because we as educators we cannot do our jobs without a steady supply of good books coming into the world. So let me explain. Education Minnesota is the labor union of educators all over the state, from preschool teachers to paraprofessionals to classroom teachers to instructors in the state two-year colleges and even some professors in the University of Minnesota system. If you asked any of those educators what they want for their students, they would probably give you some variation of this answer. I want my students to become curious adults and lifelong learners. We don't always succeed, of course. There are many adults who disappear into their smartphones and they never have another independent thought. You usually find them on Twitter after 10 p.m. But sometimes, we do light that fire in our students and we inspire the habits of the mind that bring people into libraries, into the bookstores, and Saturday night celebrations of the written word. We start our youngest learners on this path with books that are bright colors with big type and we help them to understand an overwhelming world and the people that are in it. They learn how casting a lure into a pond with your father can be more than fishing. Or the numinous affinity between all things round. Our middle schoolers like books that help them understand where they fit into the world. And can an 11-year-old girl who feels like she is part of nothing but responsible for everything stand up to a big corporation? How about the brainy little boy who sees so deeply into the world around him that all of the other kids think that he is weird? Is there a place for him? High school students read to escape the stress of their young lives, and they go off to different planets and find complicated romance. They dive deep into the dark histories of their families and find complicated romance. <laughs> 
I'm here to tell you that there's just as much drama in high school today as there was when all of you were there. There is also real tragedy, though. First loves who die too soon and friends who slip away forever, like a dropped hat that sinks out of sight below the surface of a lake. I don't want this to get too political, but there are elected officials in Minnesota who don't want teachers to expose high school students to anything controversial, and especially issues around race and identity. These leaders just don't understand that these topics never leave the minds of these students, regardless of what their teacher said. Our teens are looking for guidance on how to make their way into the world, and they need poems about being an Asian American and poor and stories about young Native American women who grew up surrounded by people who don't look like them. And they need fresh views of the African American experience sharpened through the lens of imaginative fiction. Later, once our students learn to use these books to comprehend their world and understand themselves, they are on their way to becoming curious adults. Some might even become teachers themselves, though it won't be easy. Right, Mr. Rad? So why again are Minnesota educators spending their dues money on a book awards? Because the cycle breaks if we do not have great books waiting for our students when they are through with us. Oh, and one other reason. We live in Minnesota, and everyone in our state benefits when more people know about things. For example, how fear produced at an, industri at an industrial scale erodes our society and our form of government. Or how a working class kid from the Iron Range could grow up and become a larger than life federal judge. Or how funk and soul music helped shape the Twin Cities. Or how a genius artist can say more in a single editorial cartoon than a dozen writers with two full pages of newsprint. <laughs> but very simply, everyone benefits when more people know about anything. And so, book by book and student by student, we can all make our state a little bit richer. And that is why Education Minnesota is so proud to sponsor the Minnesota Book Awards. So from all of us, thank you authors for all that you do. Thank you so much, Rodney. We're so appreciative of the work you do with Education Minnesota and for this partnership. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our host for the evening, Rohan Preston. A playwright, poet, and photographer, Rohan has been theater critic at the Star Tribune since 1998. He previously wrote for the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times. A graduate of Yale, he and his wife, the poet Angela Shannon, are parents to two daughters. Please join me in welcoming Rohan Preston. Thank you and good evening. Good evening. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here uh, in this uh, august um, gathering. Um, this is uh, it's a very special community that we live in. Um, I moved here 20 years ago, and um, I, had, I didn't know Minnesota at the time. And um, what I knew about Minnesota was confirmed um, last week with a blizzard. Um, uh, but. Um, what I've grown to know is the secret, which is that this is an amazing community with amazing, amazing artistic support, amazing artists, um, a, a plethora of, of, of creativity and genius. Doesn't mean that we're immune to all the challenges of the rest of the country. We have those too, but those are the things that motivate us and, and push us forward. So I'm delighted, I'm honored uh, to be here tonight, and um, thank you very much um, for asking me to be your MC. So, um, 
We are here tonight to celebrate the accomplishments of your fellow Minnesotans and partners in the literary community. But before we get to tonight's nominees, let's pause to remember th those we have lost. Over the last year, we have had to say goodbye to several beloved members of that community whose spirit and words live on, including two-time Minnesota Book Award winner, Sherry Register, author of Packing House Daughter and The Big Marsh. Patricia Johnson McDonald, publisher of Afton Press and a Minnesota Book Award winner. J. Otis Powell, writer, performer, performance artist, mentor and teacher, and musician. And Susan Stan, renowned children's book professor and advocate. They will be dearly missed. Now, switching moods, on to tonight's honorees. There were 256 submissions for the nine category awards um, we'll be presenting tonight, in addition to three special awards. Previous Minnesota Book Award winners are here to present the honors, which include a hand-blown glass award by St. Paul artist Dick Huss, and then the Willie August Project is backed. That is uh, their music, absolutely. Their music has been uh, written up in national jazz publications, and band leader Ben Seams has customized music for each winning title from both original work and adaptation. So feel free to chat with the quartet after the awards to find out more about their recordings and performances. All right, let's get started. We begin this evening with an appropriate um, award um, for the state, the category of Minnesota nonfiction. The four writers and and books that comprise the finalists for this award help us plumb the depths of our state history and shared culture. The category is sponsored by St. Mary's University of Minnesota, enriched by the LaSallean Catholic heritage. St. Mary's University of Minnesota awakens, nurtures, and empowers learners to ethical lives of service and leadership. Please joining, join me in recognizing St. Mary's University of Minnesota. I also just want to say, I hope your hand clapping uh, skills are pra well practiced, because we're going to use a lot of that tonight. So i um, here to present the award and give a brief remembrance of last year's winner is Mary Lethard Wingert, the 2011 Book Award and 2012 Hegnander Minnesota History Award winner for North Country, The Making of Minnesota. Well, I'm very happy to be here this evening to celebrate all the fine work created by the 2018 Minnesota Book Award nominees, but I do wish I were not the person standing on the stage, because traditionally, each of the Minnesota Book Awards is presented by the previous year's winner. But sadly, last year's winner, the talented and generous-spirited Sherry Register, passed away last month. Sherry was twice the recipient of a Minnesota Book Award, first for her unforgettable memoir, Packing House Daughter, that beautifully evokes the dignity and fragility of working class lives. And then last year for The Big Marsh, the story of a lost landscape, where she turned her gift for empathy and luminous prose into a memoir of the land itself. Sherry will be greatly missed, but not only for her literary talents. She was even more lovely as a person and as a friend than in the words she wove so beautifully on the page. She would have loved to be here tonight because she was unfailingly supportive of fellow writers and seemed to savor their success as much as her own, and I can personally attest to that. So I'm channeling her cheers along with mine for the talented writers I'm about to introduce. And as always with this category, nonfiction is a very big tent. And the four finalists can hardly be compared to one another, as you'll soon see. 
If only we had more categories, each is certainly award-worthy and deserves a rousing round of applause. But please hold it in <laughs> until they've all been announced. And so, here are the finalists. A bag worth a pony, the art of the Ojibwa bandolier bag by Marcia G. Anderson, published by the Minnesota Historical Society Press. Got to be something here, the rise of the Minneapolis sound by Andrea Swenson, published by the University of Minnesota Press. Miles Lord, the maverick judge who brought corporate America to justice by Roberta Walburn, also published by the University of Minnesota Press. And finally, but not least, Sights, Sounds, Soul, The Twin Cities Through the Lens of Charles Shambliss by Davu Saru, photography by Charles Shambliss, published by the Minnesota Historical Society Press. And the award goes to, I hope I'm not gonna be like Warren Beatty, Award goes to, for Minnesota nonfiction, to Andrea Swenson. Got to be something here. The rise of the Minneapolis sound. It is a really uh, complicated day to accept this award because it's the two year anniversary that we lost Prince. And um, a big part of what I hoped to do with this book was to really contextualize him and humanize him in, within the history of the place where he came from and a place that he was so proud of. Um, I would like to thank Prince uh, for encouraging me. Um, I would like to thank my editor, Eric, uh, for saying two really important words, keep going. And I would like to uh, dedicate this award to all of the unsung heroes in our music scene that have not had the opportunity to be heard because of racism, sexism, classism, and white supremacy. Thank you. That's beautiful, and it uh, makes me wish, actually, that I'd worn purple tonight. So, um, you know, let's go crazy. Um, now we'll move to picture books with the award for children's literature sponsored by Books for Africa, the world's largest shipper of donated text and library books to the African continent. Based in St. Paul, BFA, BFA, has been working to end the book drought in Africa for more than 25 years. Let's give them a warm round of applause. <laughs> Presenting the award is J.J. Austrian, last year's winner for Worm Loves Worm. J.J. They say that one of the keys to a good picture book is brevity. The finalists for children's literature are <laughs> A Different Pond by Bao Fi, <laughs> illustrated by T. Bui, published by Capstone Young Readers, Mighty Moby by Ed Young, text by Barbara DaCosta, published by Little Brown Books for Young Readers, Hatchet Book Group. Hachette, excuse me. Round by Joyce Sidman, illustrated by Tai Un Yu, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And The Shape of the World, a portrait of Frank Lloyd Wright by K. L. Going, illustrated by Lauren Stringer, published by Beach Lane Books, Simon & Schuster. And the award goes to Bao Fi. Yeah. 
Make some noise for beginner's luck. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it, it's a good thing because the children's book community in Minnesota is so mean <laughs> and competitive. It's just, no, actually the complete opposite is true. Thank you so much to the Kids Lit community in Minnesota being so welcoming and gracious to a beginner. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really quickly, um, I, I gotta thank Jossie Hale, Curtis Galetta, um, people uh, who really helped me directly with the book. That would be Molly Beth Griffin, Sarah Park Dolan, Shannon Gibney. Um, I really wanna thank all the librarians, teachers, and parents who got this book for kids. Um, uh, I really gotta give a shout out, obviously, to the wonderful illustrator, T. Bui, who, um, <laughs> This is really her book as well as mine, and so props to T. Um, and Capstone, um, I, you know, thank you so much for publishing this book. Not just for publishing it, but the way that you published it. Um, it it's just been an amazing experience, thank you. Especially to uh, Jennifer and Chrissy. Chrissy edited the heck out of this book. And, uh, uh, and thank you so much. And last thing, um, thank you to the, of course, the We Need Diverse Books movement. Uh, thank you all so much. I, thank you. Congratulations. I love this music too. Um, our third award is for a novel and short story, and it's sponsored by Fitzgerald and St. Paul. They're in the house, an organization devoted to celebrating author F. Scott Fitzgerald as an artist and icon, especially here in his hometown of St. Paul. Through events and educational programs, Fitzgerald and St. Paul serves as an ambassador to Fitzgerald's history. Please join me in recognizing Fitzgerald in St. Paul. So our four finalists for this uh, award range from debut authors to veteran award winners with a vast fictional array of styles and stories. Joining us to present the award is Minnesota Book Award winner and author of Vestments, John Reimringer. John? I've had the good fortune to be on sabbatical for the last year, and I was really dreading getting up in front of a crowd since I've been, not been in front of a classroom even. But J.J. Austrian removed all, all pressure because his intro was so good. I was like, okay, I give up. Um, I'd like to thank Elaine for asking me to fill in for last year's winner, Peter Guy. It's always fun to stand in front of a big crowd and hand out a prize. Um, Thanks to the friends of the St. Paul Public Library for hosting this marvelous event year after year, to tonight's finalists for enriching our lives and literature, and to the readers of Minnesota for completing that fictional dream. All of tonight's fiction finalists share some elements of the fantastical, but they also give us the enduring gift of literature. They invite us into the lives and inner spaces of others, and in a world that today is often only screen deep, storytelling reminds us to slow down, to consider, and to be compassionate. And this year's finalists are Future Home of the Living God by Louise Erdrich, published by Harper <laughs> Collins Publishers. 
Stories for a Lost Child by Carter Meland, published by Michigan State University Press. The Through by A. Raphael Johnson, published by Jaded Ibis Press. And What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky by Leslie Neka Arima, published by Riverhead Books and Penguin Random House. So it's so exciting. And the award goes to Leslie Neka Arima. Thank you. Um, I did not expect this. Um, I want to thank everyone who uh, not only told me that I could keep going, but those who challenged me and pushed me to be better and pushed back against the work that I had done. Um, you know, the people who make up your community are the wedding stone on which you sharpen your skills. And so I thank them so much for um, being exactly what I needed. Uh, when I moved to Minnesota about a decade ago, I came from Louisiana and before that Nigeria, and um, I heard all about how cold it gets here, and so I bundled up with boots, sweater, scarf, and disembarked in Minneapolis in August. And <laughs> <laughs> and was extremely uncomfortable. Um, and then, you know, and then once winter rolled around, I was also unprepared for that because I did not realize that it was possible to get as cold as it did here. Um, I'm very happy that I stuck it out and that I, you know, stayed in Minnesota after graduation, um, graduating from my MFA program to take advantage of all of the resources that Minnesota has to offer for artists and Minnesota is a state that cares for its artists and shows that with very practical things like monetary support. And so I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. Things are clicking along really well here. Congratulations to all the winners so far, and really, um, all of our um, nominees are winners. So in addition to an honoring the writers and illustrators for their tremendous work this evening, we also celebrate those who have helped create our um, kinetic, frenetic, and uh, really marvelous literary e ecosystem. Next is a special award bestowed on an individual or an organization for outstanding contributions to Minnesota's literary community. And it's named for Kay Sexton, a career bookseller and dedicated arts advocate. The award is sponsored by St. Catherine University, a private Catholic liberal arts university. It's coming, it's coming. That is committed to developing effective ethical leaders through study, practice, and real life experience. Here tonight to introduce the Case Sexton Award honoree with a special video tribute is Lana Barkawi, Executive and Artistic Director of MISNA. Good evening, everybody. I could not be more pleased to join this tribute to Catherine Haddad. I'm gonna say a few words, but first, please turn your attention to the screens for, the, for a brief look at her exceptional literary life.
Kathy Haddad is an accomplished writer and playwright, and I've long admired her work, especially with Love from Ramallah and Zafira, the Olive Oil Warrior. She founded Mizna, the country's first Arab-American literary journal, and this journal has been absolutely instrumental to the burgeoning of Arab-American literature, both in Minnesota and nationally. Mizna was founded by Kathy Haddad in the late 90s. She and others she was in community with saw this profound gap in the literary landscape for Arab American letters. And so she gathered the smart Arab and Muslim folks she knew and launched the organization to publish the journal. Not only has the organization always had the mission to publish excellent writing, it was based on such a solid foundation of ideas that we still think a lot about as a culture 20 years later. Since the very first issue of the journal, the voices that we've published and championed over the years have been Arabs and Muslims who are gay and straight, who are religious and also estranged from religion, who represent the geographic diversity of the Middle East and North Africa, who are artists and business peoples and people from all walks of life. Kathy's contribution to the world of literature, of theater, of culture shaping is really unparalleled at a time when there was no space at all for Arab, Arab-American literature or Arab-American conversation. Kathy had the bold, audacious, uh, strong vision to create a Mizna. Because of the spaces that Kathy has created, it is absolutely clear how we define what a visionary means. Haddad has given of her own time and talents, and this gift has benefited not just the Arab-American community or just the Minnesota literary community, but our community and nation as a whole. Haddad and Mizna, in her contributions as a writer, editor, and leader, have been crucial to fighting against the forces of darkness in our country and bringing both enlightenment and enrichment to our culture and society. Catherine is truly a trailblazer. Um, I want to um, go on a little bit of a tangent, um, just briefly, but I'm going to bring it back. Currently, a mutual friend of ours, um, the brilliant and audacious writer, uh, the Palestinian and Muslim American Renda Jarrar, is being lambasted for some uh, tweets that she wrote. Um, uh, about something that's being really overlooked in um, the eulogizing of Barbara Bush right now, which is um, her um, the racist and warmongering things that she's um, that she stood for. Um, Fresno State, the university where Renda Jarrar is a tenured faculty, has launched an investigation, and many hateful people are putting pressure on the school to fire her. I bring this up partly um, to encourage you to look into this and to let Fresno State know that they must support Gerard's First Amendment rights, but also because I really appreciated something that Renda Gerard shared today, um, a quote by the writer Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison in 1981, um, in a keynote address at the American Writers' Congress said, we don't need any more writers as solitary heroes. We need a heroic writer's movement, assertive, militant, and pugnacious. Um, Kathy Haddad's um, singular vision and her fierce support of Arab American writers and writing um, has spawned such a movement, uh, and it's national. Um, it's assertive, it's militant, and it's pugnacious, and I'm so proud to be part of it. Um, along with um, my friend Sagira Shahid, the incredible poet, um, uh, who really spearheaded the nomination of Kathy Haddad, um, I want to say that we're so grateful to what Kathy has done and what she continues to do. Um, on behalf of St. Catherine University, the Minnesota Book Awards, and the entire Minnesota book community, it is my honor to present the Kay Sexton Award to Catherine Haddad.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lana. Uh, thank you to the friends of the St. Paul Library for making this event happen today, to Lana Barkawi for all she does for so wonderfully making sure that that rain cloud in the desert that is Mizna continues to move forward. Thanks to my parents and family for their support, love, and guidance, especially my father who died four years ago next month, who instilled in me pride in our heritage through his own stories and his being in the world. And thanks to the people who had a bit of power and pulled us with them over the last 25 years, especially David Mura, Carolyn Holbrook, and Deepankar Mukherjee, three people who I've learned so much from and have inspired me, dreamt with me, and taught me to continue on. I wouldn't be here today without their support and powerful guidance. Not too long ago, in events like this, it would have been unheard of for Arab Americans to claim a moment like this one. I'm pleased to see how things are slowly changing in some of our literary and art circles to include Arab American voices. But much more needs to happen to make sure our voices are heard and protected in universities, in public school classrooms, on our stages, in film, publishing, and of course on the ground where people are trying to survive. In this time of Islamophobia, anti-Arab racism, the squelching of civil rights, bombs being dropped on our people, we need Arab American voices more than ever. Thanks again for this honor, and here's to all the others who are speaking and writing and creating in refugee camps, in universities, and in their rooms late at night. May their words rise above the noise that has been designed to silence them. Thank you. Congratulations. Now we have the Memoir and Creative Nonfiction Award category sponsored by Fager ba Baker Daniels, a full service law firm providing business solutions to local, national, and international organizations. Let's recognize Fager Baker Daniels. The personal experiences of this year's writers show us journeys that lead to understanding and reflection and represent the balancing act between obsession and vocation. Here tonight as a presenter is Kao Kalia Yang, two-time book award winner, most recently for last year's The Song Poet, A Memoir of My Father. So I know you all can't see me, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be here to lend my voice in commending these four authors for the work that they do because, because I love creative nonfiction. In a, for a Hmong girl who faced the nonfiction monsters of this world, I did not know where to turn or how to, how to harness the heart of me onto the page. It was through the lens of creative nonfiction that I could free my imagination, find the swords of my ancestor, and, and make a place for myself in this world that I'm finding so much love in. And so it is my pleasure and a tremendous privilege to announce this year's finalists. Give a Girl a Knife by Amy Thielen, published by Clarkson Potter and Crown Publishing. It won't be easy, an exceedingly honest and slightly unprofessional love letter to teaching by Tom Rodemacher, published by the University of Minnesota Press. Marcel's Letters of Font and the Search for One Man's Fate by Carolyn Porter, published by Skyhorse Publishing. And Oniga May Singh, Seasons of Ojibwe Year by Linda Lagarde Grover, published by University of Minnesota Press. And the award goes to Linda Lagarde Grover, Seasons of Noche Bayer.
I would like to thank all the wonderful people at the University of Minnesota Press. I would like to thank my, my husband, Tim, my, my daughters, Wabasu and Sigesis, and Wabashgeshi, my grandchildren, and um, most of all, my, my grandparents and the people of ger their generation who made it possible for, for me to be here. And we all of my generation now are honored to hand on their legacy to the next one. So, miigwech. It's so exciting to see the richness of this, this community coming up here. It's just, it's just wonderful. Our next category is general nonfiction, a category sponsored by the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University, liberal arts colleges whose unique partnership provides students with a highly engaged learning experience, preparing them for leadership in a global society. Let's recognize the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. In my next life, I'm gonna develop an NPR voice, by the way. <laughs> um, the compelling accounts that comprise this category are by four distinguished authors, all of whom are new to the awards. Presenting this two-time book award, presenting is two-time book award winner, Sean Otto, author of last year's The War on Science, Who's Waging It, Why It Matters, What We Can Do About It. Sean. You guys, it's such an honor to be presenting this category. Great stories are as important in nonfiction as they are in fiction. The work by this year's finalists in general nonfiction captures our hearts and minds with truly great stories. From a moving photo documentary of ranch life to laugh out loud editorial cartoons, from living through World War I to navigating life in modern democracy, each of these amazing books draws us in with stories of a young Minnesotan abroad during wartime, of a disappearing way of life in the American West, of a step-by-step -step abdication of democracy as fear overcomes the ability to self-govern, and of the ridiculous ironies and sometimes deeply touching moments in our political process, stories of the world around us. This year's finalists are um, Alice in France, The World War I Letters of Alice M. O'Brien by Nancy O'Brien Wagner, published by Minnesota Historical Society Press. Yes. The first and only book of Sack, 36 Years of Cartoons for the Star Tribune by Steve Sack, published by Star Tribune Media Company. Fortress America. How We Embraced Fear and Abandoned Democracy by Elaine Tyler May, published by Basic Books, an imprint of Hachette Book Group. And finally, Mountain Ranch by Michael Krauser, published by University of Texas Press. And the award goes to Steve Sack. The first and only book of Sack, 36 years of cartoons for the Star Tribune. Libraries, I love librarians. I, uh, I learned cartooning from libraries. Every week when I was 13 years old, I would go to our local West St. Paul library to look at the magazines, the cartoons in the magazines, the Saturday Evening Post, the New Yorker, uh, Look Magazine. Um, I also looked at the National Geographic for a completely different reason. But uh, I love librarians. I have to thank my boss, Scott Gillespie, for pestering me for years to do this book. Um, Dave Banks and Mike Rice for pounding it into shape. 
uh, Tom Rainey and Steve Yeager, our marketing gurus, uh, for selling the thing, and Martha Parrish for solving innumerable problems. Uh, most of all, I want to thank the Star Tribune for giving me a platform for 36 years so far. Um, you know, you look around this room and you see writers and artists at the top of their game. It's exciting, it's exhilarating, inspiring, and I feel that every day when I walk into the offices of the Star Tribune. Thank you. I once told, uh, told him that, um, actually it wasn't once, it was just um, before the event started this evening, <laughs> but I, was, <laughs> I, t I, told, uh, I, I told Steve, I said, you're my favorite uh, editorial uh, cartoonist, and um, he says, is there another? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, um, and it's, it's great to work with such a, a fine, fine colleague. Now we're pleased to honor uh, Minnesota Book Artists for excellence and contributions to Minnesota Book Arts community with the Book Artist Award, sponsored by Learner Publishing Group and presented with Minnesota Center for the Book Arts. Early in its history, M MCBA was housed at Learner, and the, spon and the sponsorship of the Book Artist Award continues a long tradition and interest in book arts on the part of Learner Publishing Group. Here to make tonight's presentation is last year last year's Book Artist Award winner, Stephen McCarthy. I'm honored to be here tonight to help celebrate book artist Erica Spitzer Rasmussen in recognition of the excellence of her work, The Love Affair, a mixed media sculptural book handcrafted from pieces of old family letters in particular, her, her grandparents' love letters. The work was praised by the review panel as, quote, playful, clever, and referential in its reference to the art of love letters, an avant-garde play on the notion of a book. And yet, the narrative, the history, and the intimacy are mysteriously palpable. On behalf of Lerner Publishing Group, the Minnesota Book Awards, and the Minnesota Center for Book Arts, I present the 2018 Book Artist Award to Erica Spitzer Rasmussen. After my mother's death, I inherited two boxes with love letters exchanged between my grandparents in the 1930s before they were wed. She lived in Manhattan, he lived in Washington State. When the idea came to me that I should cut the letters up and make a book, I asked my aunt for permission. I also told my uncle on the other side of the family about my plan. He, being a historian, urged me not to do it. But after my aunt agreed, I tentatively cut into the first letter. It felt sacrilegious. I was positive that I was going to be struck down by lightning. <laughs> but when the lightning didn't come, I was assured that the project had potential. After reading, cutting, and interspersing the letters, I bound them with a Coptic stitch. This was difficult because the antique papers just seemed to disintegrate in my hands. It took four months to make the book that uh, included over 6,000 pages. The book was placed in one of the wooden boxes 
handcrafted by my grandfather in the form of an infinity symbol to suggest that the couple might continue their communion from life into death. When I received the call that I had won the award, I cried with happiness. Receiving the award signified three things. One, the risk of cutting up the love letters paid off. <laughs> Instead of going into storage for another generation, this meant that my grandparents' correspondence could be enjoyed by a larger audience. Two, receiving the award meant that I have finally arrived as a bookmaker. Although I've been teaching bookmaking for years, and my books reside in a handful of museums and national libraries, I'm trained as a painter, and most often I exhibit as a sculptor. This award affirms my bookbinding abilities. Three, I was able to call my uncle and declare <laughs> I've been vindicated. <laughs> Gratitude is due to Lerner Publishing Group, the Friends of the St. Paul Public Libraries, and the Minnesota Department of Education. Gratitude is due to Minnesota Center for Book Arts that has provided me with papermaking facilities and bookmaking expertise for over 20 years. Gratitude is due to my family who support me in every aspect of my artistic work. And gratitude is due to Metropolitan State University that helps me to execute some of my book projects abroad and also allows me to teach a new generation of book artists. Thank you. Thank you all who contribute to a thriving, book-loving community. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, Erica. If you haven't already seen the love affair during the reception, I urge you to stop by uh, after the ceremony downstairs and take a look for yourself as as for the first time we have the Minnesota Book Awards winners piece available to for view so thank you and congratulations also want to do a quick shout out to those who are sitting in in uh, the court section out there yes yes um, you are vital to this uh, affair as well so want to make sure that we do that. So um, our next award um, is for the middle, for middle grade literature, comprised of fiction and nonfiction for young readers. And it's with an acclaimed group of authors as finalists. Let's recognize our sponsor, Education Minnesota. And here to present the award in a dapper bow tie is Brian Farry, two-time Minnesota Book Award winner. Last year's honoree was the secret Dread Willow Cars. Brian. Good evening. In recent months, We've witnessed the youth across our country rise up to prove they are smart, resilient, and capable of demonstrating these qualities in ways that are both surprising and inspiring. As someone who has written numerous books for ages eight and up, I can testify to the fact that it is an extreme privilege to write for this audience. A wealth of today's finest voices in middle grade literature call Minnesota home, and I'm delighted to be here tonight to stand side by side with four of my writing colleagues whose work not only challenges readers, but also illuminates who they really are. Here are the finalists. A Crack in the Sea by H.M. Bauman, published by G.P. Putnam Sons, Penguin Random House. The End of the Wild by Nicole Helgett, published by Little Brown and Company, 
Hachette book group. Isaac the Alchemist, Secrets of Isaac Newton, revealed by Mary Lozier, published by Candlewick Press. And Rooting for Rafael Rosales, by Curtis Scaletta, published by Albert Whitman and Company. And the award goes to <clears throat> 30th Annual Minnesota Book Award for Middle Grade Literature goes to Nicole Helgett, The End of the Wild. <laughs> before. I might not leave. <laughs> Mostly I just want to thank the young readers. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited to turn this world over to them. <laughs> also, thanks to my agent and my publishing company and the great state of Minnesota, and especially the teachers and librarians and my wonderful family. Um, my Love, Eric is here somewhere. I love you. Um, thank you. Congratulations. So we've heard from a, a great range of writers has been honored thus far tonight with more to come. Over the last 30 years, nearly 1,400 books have been selected as finalists and 337 as winners through the Minnesota Book Awards program. And that is not even counting all of the special awards. This program's impact stretches well beyond the awards ceremony, so please turn your attention now to the screens for a deeper look into the Minnesota Book Awards. Do you know stories? are important for so many reasons. We tend to think of stories just as entertainment, but stories do so much more. Stories enlighten us, and they encourage us, and they inspire us. And as communities, stories bring us together around common uh, issues, common themes, common values. Um, and you can talk to people in terms of polemics and essays and, and speechify. But you'll never reach people, you'll never get to their hearts in the same way you can with a story. One of the things I love about the Minnesota Book Award is the fact that they take book award winners and nominees and they tour them. The Friends of the Library and the Minnesota Book Award program take literature, take the writers, the artists out there is so important. Viking Library System is in western Minnesota with 11 independent libraries. And we've had Minnesota Book Award winners and finalists in communities as small as 500 and as large as 13,000. We've got this reader and we've got this book and there's some sort of connection with the author. And so when the reader can connect with the author as well, there's so much more that, that makes that experience richer. We support our arts and our artists to an amazing extent. We attract terrific talent here to Minnesota. People come just to be here because it's an environment that fosters creativity on every level and in every medium. And the writing community certainly has benefited from that. I never thought I wanted to be a writer. Growing up, I always thought that I should become a doctor. Everybody said you needed doctors and lawyers to survive in America. There was a bookmobile that would visit the McDonough Housing Project. And one day, after months and months of visiting, I asked her in a whisper, are there books about people like me? And she looked to the shelves and she found a book about uh, the Chinese, the Japanese, one about the Vietnamese. And then she looked at me and she said, I'm sorry, I cannot find a book about the Hmong, about your people. And I remember saying, one day a little girl is going to come right in here and she's going to find a book about the people who love her on these shelves. Maybe that was the first articulation 
of my inspiration and my motivation for entering into writing. But even after that moment, I thought I should become what my people needed. That I realized that maybe I was going to be that writer. There are not a lot of writers who look like me or who sound like me in the world that we live in. I think winning the, the Minnesota Book Awards gave me a kind of credibility that certainly my race and my gender cannot, cannot garner. Stories do not only belong to those who look through them, they belong to those who share in them. I'm so proud to stand here today as a Minnesotan writer with the force of Minnesota behind me because in the last year I've discovered for a whole community that it is possible. Hi, my name is Beth Burns, and I am the president of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. And I watched that video, <laughs> thank you. I watched that video a bunch of times so that I wouldn't cry when I had to get up here, but Kalia, darn it, um, you get me every time. I get to stand here in front of you with now a year and a half under my belt in this role. I kind of cringe when I think of saying hi last year for the first time, of the audacity of standing up when I still had so much to learn. But now I know not even to worry about that because learning is for a lifetime. And I hope to keep learning with you for many years to come in that regard. So I was thinking about writing and and what it is to celebrate this literary community and how I wanted to um, come to you this evening. And one of the things I um, was always told is writing is a very solitary act. But I look around here tonight and nothing could be more wrong. Yes, so many of you have already been generous this evening by sharing your incredible talents, but somebody else is making you coffee or deciding it's time for a glass of wine. Somebody else is picking up a, something, a task, a chore, so that maybe you can get those 600 more words that are gonna make the day feel complete and get you ready for the next thing. And then you've got publishers and editors and friends who will meet you and say, keep going. And this means that writing can't possibly be a solitary act. How could it be solitary if I am blinded looking out here this evening but see 900 people in two rooms? Hi. Um, I can see them. <laughs> it's really funny. Hi. Uh, who are all here tonight to celebrate 30 years that we've been doing this. 30 years that you have been doing this. And so, it's a privilege, and it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I thank you for every solitary, super frustrating and wonderful breakthrough moment that all of you who are the artists and the authors and the creators have had over the years, finalists, winners alike. But I also thank the whole community that has supported you in the, creat the creation of your work and this whole community that gathers year after year to acknowledge we really do live in a super special place. Um, those of us who live in St. Paul live in a super, super special place, <laughs> but the rest of you who are also Minnesotans live in a very special place too. And our ecosystem that meets you in McDonough with a bookmobile, invites you into the library, gets you that library card, which is a passport for learning and reading and doing. The colleges and universities and schools that train us and teach us and encourage us, the publishers, this rich, rich publishing community that recognizes this talent and brings it forward into the universe. All of us are here tonight celebrating 30 years, but a whole history even behind that of wonderful literary arts in Minnesota. So we should be proud of what we're doing. And in these serious times, because there's definitely a vibe right now, and we can't pretend that's not there, but we need the Steve Sachs, and we need the serious conversations, and we need to remember that it is the two-year anniversary of Prince's death, and that all of us makes, all of that makes us who we are and helps us understand the world in which we live. And so, again, for the second year in a row, I will not apologize 
when I ask you to please consider, are you able to financially support this? Because this does not happen in a vacuum, and would you be willing this evening to please do the thing that I completely forgot to do last year when I asked for your support, which was actually tell you how to do it. Um, this year they gave me a sheet of paper, but I am sincerely asking you if it is, if it is possible for you to not only contribute your time, your talent, your enthusiasm to this writing community, but to make an additional financial contribution that will help us at the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library continue to produce the 31st, the 32nd, and hopefully the 100th anniversary of the Book Awards. I hope you'll take the time to do that now. So here's what I didn't tell you last year. On every table is a pledge card and an envelope for you to use. We love checks, we love credit cards, and for those of you who are super savvy and can text a gift, I've even got a number to tell you to do that. Um, texting is right there, oh good, 651-412-3277. And we're gonna take a couple minutes to let you think about doing that. This is what we're doing now, so feel free to reach out for those envelopes um, and and pledge cards, um, and we'll be grateful for that. And please know, at the Friends, we are going to continue to be really good stewards of the resources that you entrust to us. We will be very grateful um, for anything you're able to share with us this evening so that we can continue to stand behind this amazing literary community and make sure that readers and writers thrive in one of the very best places to live, Minnesota. Thank you. So um, after you've made um, your pledge, your donation, uh, you can leave your envelope on the table. It will be collected there. Um, and if it's, uh, it's, it's, um, if it's online through texting or, or whatever, that's, um, that's pretty easy as well. Um, I just want to give you a, a little thing from my bailiwick um, about this culture. Um, uh, I interviewed August Wilson a number of times, uh, the great playwright a number of times, who, who moved here from Pittsburgh um, to find himself and his voice. Uh, he came here as a poet um, and uh, left here as a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and now um, one of the foundational um, playwrights of, of, of the American theater. Um, and he said, um, he said to me, um, I, I came to Minnesota um, I didn't know it at the time, but I came here to hear the voices of my childhood, of my ancestry, of all of that. I mean, this award ceremony today, uh, the diversity of winners and the, and the broadness of the talent is a testament uh, to the kind of um, uh, growth and hospitality and, um, and um, uh, frenetic uh, creativity that's happening here in Minnesota at this moment. It's a very, very special moment, and I, as someone who writes about this uh, community in one, one particular area, I'm just thrilled and honored to be here, um, and, and really honored as well for all, all the winners. I mean, the stories, um, uh, and, and, and Beth uh, eloquently spoke about the stories are, are what um, unite us, um, what uh, lead us into knowledge and, and self-discovery and, um, and, and we have all of that here, so, so. All right, thank you, Beth. So the final special honor of this evening is a biennial award for the full-length book of scholarship on the topic of Minnesota history. It's funded by the Hegnander Family Foundation. The inspiration of Orville Joe Hegnander this award stems from his family's belief in the importance of studying and preserving history and in their long-standing relationship with the Minnesota Historical Society. Please join me in recognizing Joe Hegnander and his fiance Nadia Christensen for their efforts to pay tribute to scholarly works on Minnesota history. Here to present the award to the 2018 honoree is William Green, 
winner of the 2016 Hegnander Award for Degrees of Freedom, The Origin of Civil Rights in Minnesota, 1865 to 1912. Mr. Green. Good evening. I'm honored to be here tonight to present the Hognander Minnesota History Award to Gary Kalnonen uh, for his book, Flames of Discontent, the 1960 Or Strike, from a field of, of immensely worthy books published in, 19, in, in two, 2016 to 2017. His book was reviewed and chosen by history professor and writer Douglas Hurt, who noted, this is an important study of a major labor dispute in Minnesota, and as such, a significant contribution for the state's history. But it is more than that. Kaunonen's uh, study of the Finnish miners in, in the Mesabi and Vermilion region uh, of the Iron Range, and their relationship to the industrial workers of the world uh, makes a major contribution to the labor history of the United States. So on behalf of the Minnesota Book Awards and the Hognander Family Foundation, I present the 2018 Hogna uh, Hognander Minnesota History Award to Gary Kaunaunen. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to be as ranger as I can. I'm going to dig in, that's a pun, and uh, go after it here. I'd like to first thank my, uh, my family, my wife Brooke, my parents Art and Edie who were original Iron Rangers, and the person who thinks she is my manager, my daughter Sophie. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Hognander family for their generous support of this. I'd like to thank the friends of the St. Paul Library. Uh, for putting this on, the Minnesota Historical Society, the University of Minnesota Press, and probably damn near the best editor uh, in Minnesota, Christian Tweeton. And then uh, lastly, I would like to, to thank uh, the folks who lived the strike. Uh, I had the honor and the privilege of representing their story, and uh, it's a wonderful and uh, extraordinary story uh, that revolves mainly around immigrants. And uh, with the climate that we have today and the discussions we have about immigrants, uh, it's, we should note that the faces of those immigrants within 100 years have changed, but their plight hasn't necessarily changed. Uh, so I'd like to thank them for their contributions to Minnesota and U.S. labor. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the final stretch now, and um, we have the award for poetry, um, a category sponsored by Wellington Management. Wellington Management is a real estate uh, investment, development, and property management company which values involvement and investment in the community that goes beyond real estate deals. By using their time and talents to become actively engaged in nonprofit organizations, its employees truly make a difference. Please join me in thanking Wellington Management. And Sun Yun Shin, she's coming. Last year's winner for Unbearable Splendor will present this year's award.
Gratitude to the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples and nations on whose homelands we live and work. American poet Audre Lorde, in a 1991 interview said, quote, June Jordan once said something which is just wonderful, I'm paraphrasing her, that her function as a poet was to make revolution irresistible. Well, okay, that is the function of us all as creative artists to make the truth as we see it irresistible. That's what I wanna do with all of my writing, end quote. And that's what the four poets here tonight have done with their books. This year's finalists are Autopsy by Dante Collins, published by Button Poetry. <laughs> Curator of Ephemera at the New Museum for Archaic Media by Hyde E. Erdrich. <laughs> published by Michigan State University Press. Solve for Desire by Caitlin Bailey, published by Milkweed Editions. And Thousand Star Hotel by Bao Fi, published by Coffee House Press. And the Poetry Award goes to Hyde E. Erdrich. for Archaic Media. Thank you so much. You know, when everybody else comes up here and said they didn't prepare, they were lying, but I am not. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's so sweet. I got to give this award to Sun Yingshin last year, and I'm so grateful. And I'm really grateful to the other people and all the other poets who um, accomplished making a book of poems, which is an incredibly remarkable thing in this day and age. Um, but Dante and Caitlin and Bao, I am really honored to be in your company. I have to thank people, and I can't even think of who, but my family is here, so I'll start with them. <laughs> and my editors, and my editors who are present, I really appreciate you um, for all the books that I write. Uh, there's so many great poetry opportunities in Minnesota, and it's why I live here, even though I was born here. I'm incredibly <laughs> grateful. <laughs> but one of them that not everybody gets is having librarians on your side, and I've called them my holy people, and I mean that. Thank you so much, and thank you, Wellington Property Management. Amazing. Thank you. We, we have to put that in a refrigerator magnet. That's why I live here, even though I was born here. It's funny. The penultimate award is for genre fiction. I love that word, by the way, penultimate. When I was a kid, um, I looked it up and it's like, I, was, I, I still can't understand it. I do understand it, what it means, but, but I just, I loved it. Anyway, the, the, the penultimate award is for genre fiction. This award is, uh, category is sponsored by McAllister College, committed to being a preeminent liberal arts college with an educational program noted for, noted for its high standards of scholarship and its special emphasis on internationalism, multiculturalism, and service to society. Let's give a big thank you to McAllister College. <laughs> In this category, we have returning finalists and award winners to recognize, including co-author um, P.J. Lambrecht, who passed away in the late 2016 and is still dearly missed. Please join me in welcoming Minnesota Book Award winner, Alan Eskins, to present the award, last year's honoree for the Heavens May Fall. It is my pleasure and honor to be here tonight to present the Minnesota Book Award for Genre Fiction. John Gardner defines verisimilitude as that ability to write with such detail 
and authenticity that the reader cannot help but believe that the story they are reading is true. That kind of moment-by-moment -moment authenticity is the lifeblood of every fiction writer, and I believe that is especially true for genre fiction. Our four finalists tonight have certainly hit the mark when it comes to verisimilitude, transporting their readers to the inner workings of the dark net and an epic battle of good versus evil, to the gothic halls of a tuberculosis sanitarium turned art artist retreat, where the sins of the past do not rest, to the southern border of the United States and a fight for dignity and justice, and to the hunt for a serial killer that takes us from the skyline of Twin, the Twin Cities to the cornfields of Cottonwood County. The finalists tonight for genre fiction are The Dark Net by Benjamin Percy, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, <clears throat> The End of Temperance Dare by Wendy Webb, published by Lake Union Publishing, Nothing Stays Buried by P.J. Tracy, published by G.P. Putnam and Sons, Penguin Random House, and Sulphur Springs by William Kent Kruger, published by Atria Books, Simon Schuster. And the award for genre fiction goes to Wendy Webb, The End of Temperance Dare. <laughs> expect this given um, the excellence of my co-nominees who I am all really proud to, to call friends. I just want to tell you guys a little story. I told this at the Meet the Finalists um, reception and it got a little bit of a laugh so I thought I'd let you know too. Uh, <laughs> a, a while back I was doing a reading and after it was over people were asking questions and they said, hey, you know, you write genre fiction, you write mysteries, don't you want to lend your talents to something more important? Yeah. And I said, no. <laughs> and I would even go so far as to say, hell no. <laughs> I have a great time every day thinking up the stories that I write, and I hope you guys have a great time reading them. And that's all I'm trying to do. So thank you very much. It really means a lot to me. It's here. Only one award is left on that table. So we're about to do the last award, and it's for young adult literature. The category is sponsored by BrainFuse, an educational platform which ensures that students, adult learners, and job seekers have access to a personalized, all-in-one learning experience. Please join me in thanking BrainFuse. Here to present the award is Jeff Herbach, author of several books for young readers and a book award winner for Nothing Special. Jeff. Hello, last award. It's been a great night. Um, the kids lit community in this state is powerful and it's, it's nationally recognized and that's just true. And in thinking about this crew of finalists, it, it occurs to me that maybe our amazing institutions of higher learning have something to do with that fact. Uh, these finalists have graduate degrees from St. Thomas University, from the MFAC at Hamlin University, 
like, yeah, woo, right on. <laughs> From the MFA program at Minnesota State Mankato. Yeah, let's hear a little woo, right on. And of course, from our very own Iowa Writers Workshop. <laughs> All right, no, that's a... But Peter does teach uh, at McAllister College, so it, it actually kind of works. You know, I'm thankful to live in a state with this active intellectual culture that is in no small part due to the wealth of excellent colleges and universities, both public and private, that, that create sort of a, a burbling cauldron of, of greatness. So could we have just one round of rousing Minnesota applause for, for higher learning in the state of Minnesota? Thank you. The finalists for Young Adult Literature are The Exo Project by Andrew DeYoung, published by Boyd's Mill Press Highlights. The Last Thing You Said by Sarah Byron, published by Amulet Books, Abrams. Thief's Cunning by Sarah Ayers, published by Harper Teen, Harper Collins Publishers. And Things I'm Seeing Without You, by Peter Bugnani, published by Dial Books, Penguin Random House. And the final award of the evening goes to Andrew DeYoung for the EXO Project. <laughs> surprising and very bright. Um, I, it's hard to go last. Um, I'm going to start by thanking the most important person, and that's my wife, um, who is, uh, Sarah, you're both my uh, biggest fan and my harshest critic. And um, that's like a really important uh, combination. I don't know how you pull it off. Um, thank you. I love you. Um, I share this award with you. Um, my fellow nominees, um, uh, this is the coolest club I've ever been a part of. Thank you. Um, particularly Sarah Byron, um, meeting you, uh, Sarah's awesome, meeting you, uh, releasing on the same day as you, having a launch party with you, and becoming friends with you is like one of the best things that's come out of this, so thank you so much. Um, and then just uh, to uh, the awards, the judges, thank you for taking a risk on this, on this weird little book. Um, the writing life is, act it can actually feel fairly isolated, even after you've been published, it's hard to it's uh, evidence that you're making an impact is uh, is hard to come by. So thank you for reminding me that uh, that this really does matter and that uh, we are making an impact. Thank you. Have a good night. I almost wanted to sing in other words, but no, beautiful. Um, it's, it's been a night. It's, it's really extraordinary. Um, congratulations to all of tonight's winners and all the finalists for their extraordinary work. Thank you again also to our, to our, our presenting sponsor, Education Minnesota. Give it up. And I have to say, um, earlier um, I, I stopped um, the applause for the um, University of St. Catherine because I thought it was coming up and it wasn't. So you guys were going, thank you, University of St. Catherine. <laughs> We'd like to extend a huge thank you to our local independent bookseller, Red Balloon Bookshop, which has graciously... That's all right. They've graciously agreed uh, to donate 25% of sales tonight to support the book awards. Let me also recognize uh, Minnesota Book Awards director, Elaine Hopkins.
Coordinator Bailey Wiesenmayer, and Events Director Liz Boyd. You guys have done a great job. By the way, this thing is, uh, is time to the second, and it's been excellent. And to the judges, the panelists, to all the volunteers, the staff of the Friends, all our financial supporters, to the board members, and of course, a hand to our great band here, the Willie August Project. Ben Seams is the leader, he's on guitar, Jeremy Hauer is on drums, Amanda Berghoff on cello, and Matt Peterson on upright bass. Thanks to all of you for being part of the 30th anniversary of Minnesota Book Awards. Please join us um, for the after party downstairs, um, sponsored by Metropolitan State University Foundation. There will be champagne for toasting the authors, desserts, more book sales, and a live performance by the OK Factor. And I just want to I just want to say um, a, a special thank you also to the to the friends. Um, they called and asked me, and this has been my absolute delight. Um, it's great to be in a another dimension of where we're telling stories that really honor the wealth of diversity, culture, of, of, of just the outpouring of, of, of ways of being and thinking, and it's really, really exciting. So congratulations to all of you. We live in an amazing community. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>